And good morning, afternoon, evening. How are you? Grab a cup. Ah, okay. Let me uh, turn this thing off. So I have had a few interruptions um, from my completely unscheduled and irregular broadcast schedule. And um, yeah, it's been interesting. Um, things go well for so many years, but then they don't. And uh, I learned a few things. Um, so I was messing around with a different microphone, just confirming what I've learned over the course of several years about um, audio and different microphones and what makes sense for what I'm doing here. And it's all application specific. So, you know, in some other environment, some other mic may be great, but in my environment and my surroundings and my noisy family, um, this is kind of the setup I've settled on, but I'm like, well, now that I'm doing the podcast or I'm taking this video stream, live stream and converting it into a podcast, I'm listening to it, just checking to see how it sounds. And when all you have is audio and you don't have the video to kind of distract you and you're just exclusively listening to the audio, you start to notice how the audio sounds and the audio quality. And um, it, it's fine. It's acceptable. But when I listen to other well-produced podcasts, I'm like, hmm, they sound really good and mine sounds like just there are some some issues with it you might not notice if you're listening on you know a cell phone or just earbuds or in the car or something like that you probably wouldn't necessarily notice but when i listen to it and i'm comp i i have those other well-produced podcasts as reference it's like oh so there's some things i need to clean up and it's not a big deal it's just i haven't paid attention to them before because I just never noticed. So I'm trying to just slowly incrementally learn how to improve the audio quality just a little bit, just to clean up the background noise and improve the, the actual audio signal that is being captured for the podcast. So this is for you podcast listeners. So I was playing with another microphone which theoretically could offer much better vocal quality, you know, so the sound that is captured of my voice would be technically better in, in some respects, but it has some downsides. So I was just testing that and I went ahead and I plugged it into my Focusrite audio interface. And this is a Focus Scarlet, Focusrite Scarlet 2i2 interface. It's like one of the most common PC audio interfaces in the world. And it's been that way for many years. It's not particularly expensive. It's 150, 160, something. It's under 200 US dollars. And um, for this particular one, and I went and plugged the second mic in and started testing. And I, I don't know if I was unplugging, plugging in, turning off, turning it on whatever I was doing, and it just started to freak out, wah, 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 just scratching noises and this weird echo and like 
like um, uh, reverb and feedback and just, it freaked out. And I thought, okay, that's strange. Well, okay. Then it seemed to settle down. But then this microphone, when I would speak, I would hear dis distortion. If, if I spoke quietly, it would kind of be okay. But anything in, in um, audible range uh, would be distorted. It would be scratchy and crackling at the top. And so I was like, uh-oh. So I tried this mic on a different audio interface. It was fine. So I, I was afraid I'd fried the mic. But no, these mics are pretty robust. Um, something internally, when I plugged in that second mic or when it both mics wanted phantom power, because I run this Shure SM7B with a cloud lifter that requires phantom power. And this um, condenser mic that I was testing with requires phantom power. And so I realized two things. One is, for the first time, I never tried two mics on this Focusrite. I realized if you're running two mics, you either have to have both without phantom power or both with phantom power. So that 48 volt switch there, when it's turned on, it's providing phantom power to both XLR ports. So I was like, hmm, never really thought of that before. So if you have a condenser mic and a dynamic mic, one with phantom power, one without, then you can't run both off of this focus, right, is my interpretation. And then my other, the thing that caused a problem is, I, I don't know if this is the case, but I had two mics requiring phantom power off the focus, right, and it fried. And it didn't just fry the phantom power, it actually fried the, well, I'm guessing the preamp for the XLR inputs, uh, because it's just, even if I run the this mic without phantom power, the signal is shot. So uh, it's not just the phantom power feed, it is the preamp that is just fried. So anyway, I ha now have a, um, a half working focus, right? Uh, the the amp preamps for the um, studio monitor still work, but the microphone inputs, uh, that preamp is, is shot. So this is going to a friend who's gonna play with it and uh, take it apart. So that was interesting. So I ordered a, a new focus, right? Next day, Amazon. So I was handled, that was my backup. But I said, oh, well, you know, the, the Focusrite isn't perfect. It's great for what it does. In the, in the narrow realm of PC audio interfaces, it's excellent. It's not terribly expensive. It does the job. But there's some few things I wish, like I would be happy to pay twice the price for a higher quality uh audio interface with a little better preamps, a little better hardware for like the volume knobs that start to get scratchy after a year or so. So like uh, they're going for a price point, I get it, but if they had a Focusrite Scarlet Pro 2i2, I would gladly pay more for that if it lasts a couple more years and be a little higher quality. But I haven't found it yet. There's like an $800 Apollo interface, but I'm very skeptical that it is uh, over four times better than the Focusrite, given what it does. And the other thing I'm not a fan of the Focusrite is the XLR inputs on the front. Like, I, I put them on the back, get them out of the way. Um, I, I'm sure there's a reason they did that. I, maybe they think people are unplugging, plugging in a mobile scenario for the, you know, the amateur pro server person who's using this, but. I don't, so put the XLRs in the back, get them out of the way so that I can have a cleaner desk and not have cables jutting out onto my desk. But that's minor. So I thought, well, you know, let me take this opportunity. Since this thing is fried, let me take this opportunity to try a different audio interface and, you know, upgrade. And I looked at just standard PC audio interfaces. I can't find anything that is like a... a substantial step up from the focus right there are plenty of other audio interfaces in the price range that compete uh, with the focus right and usually at a lower price point so i'm very skeptical to try them but i haven't found a 200 250 300 us dollar audio interface that says yes this one is better um so i thought well let me just go for it i don't know how i found stumbled across this but i was just searching and this popped up in in whatever google results youtube results whatever and i was like huh 
the Rode Podcaster. Well, that looks fancy. And so I started watching videos and reviews and, and audio experts that I trust, like professional audio engineers or um, not like uh, Hollywood movie set professional engineers, but, um, you know, people who do make a living off of their audio gear, they tried this and they said, wow, this seems really nice. There were a few initial flaws with the firmware and gaps and things that were fixed with subsequent firmware. Um, you know, these are one to two year old videos that I watched. But subsequently, the serious audio folks uh, seem to think this was really good. Now, it is called the Rodecaster Pro. And my understanding is the target market are podcasters. So, um, yeah, so it, it seems to be very good for the podcaster market. So if you're doing an audio podcast, excellent. All sorts of inputs, all sorts of feeds, features. It's fully self-contained, super cool product for that. Um, but for me, there were a couple caveats. One is this thing is huge. It's the size of like a 14 inch laptop. Uh, it, it's slightly bigger than my full size ThinkPad, uh, like P1, uh, you know, big laptop and it's several inches thick. So it sits on your desk. It's got the cables coming out the back. So that adds three inches on the back. So it takes up a third or a quarter of my desk. So I had to move my phone off. I had to clean off everything off my desk to make room for this beast. And it's something I'm going to use, you know, once every other week. So it's really hard to justify the desk space. And then the lights on this thing are just crazy bright. When you're muting channels, just the, the LED behind these little tiny rubber buttons at the bottom here, crazy bright. It's just like day glow screaming in your face. So I have to keep it turned off. So it's like, okay, you know, I, I don't need the huge format. I understand the, the UI and UX concept of the big sliders and all that. I don't need that because I'm not constantly adjusting stuff for a live podcast or, you know, what podcast production, the buttons. Um, and I was like, okay, maybe I can tolerate this. But the deal killer for me was that my number one use case for this would be as an audio interface to a Windows PC. And it does support that technically. It, it can fill that role. I, my impression is that wasn't the primary design and use case. It's more of a self-contained podcast studio. And for that, I totally get it would be awesome. But my number one use case is a PC audio interface. So everything I do on this thing is not to be self-contained. It's to feed into my PC, to get it in the vMix, to live stream, and to get the audio sent out. So it's just part of my audio chain to assemble audio inputs and get it into my PC. So I installed the drivers, updated the firmware, got it working, and I noticed a really weird behavior. So you'll see in the top there, like I was like, wow, it's really just pegging inputs. Even though the uh, roadcaster was set with totally normal levels, when it sends that audio signal to Windows, it's totally pegged, zero dB, just maxed out, totally distorted. It's like, that's weird. I can move the sliders down on the roadcaster, but then they show as super quiet, even though they're tolerable, tolerable levels on Windows. So for some reason, they have intentionally chosen to boost the audio signal being sent from the roadcaster into Windows via their driver by a solid 20 plus dB. I mean, it's a huge, huge boost. And I contacted road support. I was baffled. I was like, what's going on here? And they're like, oh, we do that intentionally, this person claimed. And I told them, no, this doesn't make sense. Um, well, he first said, oh, you just need to adjust your, your device volume down. I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. My other audio interfaces don't do that. So I said, please talk to your Windows device drivers. And it seems that he did. He came back and he's like, oh, they say that that is boosted in order to provide more gain and more headroom on Windows in case you, you need that extra capacity. And I'm like, What? So they are intentionally doing this with their Windows driver, so they claim to give you more headroom. 
like there's no option for me to turn this off. There's no configuration option for me to use the levels on the roadcaster and get fidelity going into Windows. It's just blasting the, you know, the levels off in Windows. So I'm like, okay. So they said, slide your device volume down to 58%. So that's how much they're increasing the volume when they're sending it to Windows. I'm like, that's crazy. So I tried this on Audacity just as a test because it's super simple. And that seemed to work. I slid Audacity device volume down to 58%. And I got similar peaks as to what I was seeing on the Roadcaster. However, he warned that different Windows machines or different DAWs, uh, digital audio workstations or whatever they're called, DAWs uh, for short, they may behave differently. Sure enough, vMix, even though I... You'll see on that top one over on the, the left, I decreased device volume by 84%. It, it varies, right? So vMix, for whatever reason, was 84%. I was getting comparable levels on the Rodecaster input on top. But you'll notice at the bottom, the master audio that is fed to the live stream was still pegged. It was still pegged uh, 0 dB, totally distorted. And no matter what I tried in vMix, I couldn't get vmix to recognize the roadcaster audio input as this whatever the levels needed to be in the master i posted a vmix forum post but for some reason that roadcaster driver that audio input just behaved utterly bizarre in vmix and i i even tried um the mixer here to mix down this input but despite that i tried that option as well in vmix to see if that mattered you'll see there that the master is still pegged at zero. So it's totally unusable for me in vMix. It's like, whoa. So I box it up, request an RMA, I'm gonna return it uh, because it's, I, it's just not usable to me. So I said, okay, back to simple. So now I said, okay, <laughs> it's stupid, but I'm not going to plug in two phantom power mics into the focus right. I'm sure it's supposed to work, but I fried one, and this isn't my first focus right. I've had to re replace others. So um, yeah, unfortunately, that's where I'm at. So I do have an older Mix Pre 3 that is fantastic field recorder, awesome device, just super high quality, but also that one gave me some really weird behavior as an audio interface, like just sampling rate or something was bizarre. I had weird delays, weird frequency issues, and I just wasn't able to figure it out. So I'm not, this this issue with audio interfaces is not new to me. That's why I'm kind of just like, okay, I'm just going to stick with the focus, right? Just path of least resistance. Um, so for now, I'm going to do some testing with my um, condenser mic on the Mix Pre 3 so that I don't fry the focus right again. So Fault tolerance and redundancy in audio interfaces. Who would have thought? So if you're thinking this is crazy, you're not necessarily wrong, but um, you know, Eric said, why aren't you just using a USB mic? Totally valid um, uh, statement. Um, but I have listened to a bunch of audio uh, microphone tests and audio samples from USB mics and Seems that my guess is the USB mics are also to, you know, created for a given price point. They are not going to create high-end, um, top-of-the-line microphones with USB audio interfaces or USB interface to a PC. Um, you know, because that's a it's just a different market. And while they sound many of them sound fine, the ones I've listened to just don't sound the same. Uh, they don't seem to have the fullness and richness of sound that the XLR mics have, the higher end ones. So sure makes a kind of pseudo competitor to this SM7B, I forget what they call it. And it's basically kind of an SM7B clone that is USB interface to your PC. You just plug it in, but it doesn't sound the same. It has slightly different audio characteristics and uh, if you know what to look, sound, listen for it, it's kind of obvious the difference. It's not bad, it's perfectly fine, but it just doesn't have the same um, audio characteristics. And I already have this, I bought this well before Sure made that USB version of the mic. Um, 
and it's super reliable. I don't want to have one more thing plugged into my PC. Um, so this works. So that's what I'm going with. But if you're saying and you don't want to mess with all this, sure. There are plenty of USB mics. There are now a few USB dynamic mics. Um, lots of condenser mics, but condenser mics are super sensitive. They pick up a lot of background noise. But there are a couple decent dynamic mics that are USB interface. So um, if you're starting out and doing this this type of thing and you don't want the background noise, a uh, USB condenser mic would probably be a good option. So on top of my fun audio challenges, frying stuff, my internet died. I'm working with my daughter on a an application for her high school and we're working online, you know, wordsmithing stuff and the browser just times out at connection error. I'm like, that's weird. <coughs> so we, we try some stuff. I do, double check my connections. And sure enough, my internet is down. I'm like, okay, maybe it's momentary. You know, occasionally we, I've had connection issues for a minute or two minutes or something, but it comes back up and who knows what it is. But this persisted 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. So I'm like, okay, I have dinner and I call the my internet service provider and do the typical things. And my setup, I have to reset their router so that I can do testing and get back to a default config. I have to plug in a laptop. So it's a whole production um, so that they can say, well, you can't use wireless. You have to test the hardware, you know, the typical frontline support stuff. So I'm hardwired directly in the router, fully reset, base config, no customizations of the router, and I've got nothing. And the router showing no coax connection. This is a Mocha router with coax to my fiber optic. It's called an ONT, optical network terminal, um, and nothing. And they did some tests. They're able to see the ONT box. They're able to reboot the ONT box, get signal there. So that's fine, they say. But that ONT is reporting no coax connection and my router is reporting no coax connection. So there's obviously something going on. So she's like, oh, you know, go trace that coax connection and plug in where, you know, there's a termination. Well, that's in my attic. And I said, there's no way I'm dragging this router up into my attic and tracing a wire and plugging it in. That's crazy. But, um, oh my gosh, did I forget this photo? Let me see if I can find it here. Um, okay, on the fly, live streaming. Do not try this at home, kids. So I, after the call, I realized, oh, well, I can actually um, test this. Oh, that's not it. And so I realized that let me get back where I can see it. I realized that there is the connection point outside my house. So you see there, that is the coax interface that comes out of the optical network terminal. So I was like, huh, I could tap right in there. So I literally grab an extension cord, set up my router in my front yard, runs i fortunately i found an old coax cable that i had in the garage from a prior house i lived in and i have plugged it in outside still nothing no uh no activity on the coax so i was pretty sure it wasn't my coax connection that was causing the problem so had to had to call out a service tech and um the one thing that the, the woman had me check during the support call, she says, oh, check the power supply. Are there lights in the power supply? And there were. So on that item labeled PSU, there are two lights and they were green. And then on the battery backup unit over on the left there, uh, there was a light that says system normal or whatever it says. And I was like, yeah, everything looks fine. And then I opened the ONT. There are lights in there. There are six lights on. Everything looked good. So she's like, everything looks fine, but it seems that there's an issue with coax connection to your router. So they had to have a tech come out. Well, the tech came out, and by, the, by that time, that was two days later, the lights on the battery backup of the PSU were off. I was like, ah, I'll bet you it's a bad, something about that PSU is bad. Sure enough, the guy comes out, he's 
old time, you know, long time uh, Verizon uh, Frontier Fios installer. And he's like, yeah, these power supplies were always bad. They're shorting out. Uh, they die. And this particular one I had was an old one from the prior homeowner. And the reason it has a battery is to support continuous telephone service in case there's a power outage. And if you're internet only, that battery backup is not required because they're not required to guarantee internet service. So he replaced it with this newer power supply for the ONT. That one does not have battery backup. So I have my APC UPS, the black box on the bottom there that can provide me with a solid hour plus of internet in case the power goes out. So yeah, he replaced it. Five minutes later, backup, everything is fine. So, you know, it's a $15, $20 part that died. The power supply produced very bizarre symptoms. The lights were on, but nobody was home. And replacing it, it eventually did totally die. And replacing it resolved the problem. Uh, but it's an obscure commercial carrier grade part, not something I could buy. And I've actually had other power supplies die and it results in some just really bizarre behavior. Uh, I've had a PC power supply die. Very strange symptoms, really hard to troubleshoot unless you have a power supply tester and know what to look for. So I bought a power supply tester, confirmed the behavior. I've had a, um, you know, the old Linksys routers. I've had the power supply on one of those die. And even though it worked, just really bizarre behavior. Um, and um, I have my ISP router die that wasn't power supply, but it just started flaking out, dropping packets, throttling connections. So really weird behavior when hardware dies, really hard to, uh, you know, to diagnose and troubleshoot unless you can fully replace the hardware. So anyway, that was interesting. So I was without internet for a couple days and that forced me to try a contingency plan, which was just to use my phone as a hotspot. And uh, I have, I don't have great cell signal here, but it's good enough where it's usable. And so that was my backup and it worked, but I learned a few things. One was that I use OneDrive, which is fine, it works well, but I used my laptop to tether to my phone and I would see stuff like this where the OneDrive files on my laptop were not fully synced. Now it does automatically sync, but on my Windows laptop, I have it set to detect my hotspot as a metered connection. And you can do that. The benefit of doing that is that it tells all your Windows applications to detect that, and it doesn't have them constantly pulling down data. So it conserves bandwidth, which I don't do it because I have a metered cell phone plan. I do it just so that I don't have 50 things hammering that uh, hotspot connection. So that's the pro. The con is that you have to enable anything you want to work and you say, yes, go ahead and connect. Even though it's a metered connection, connect Outlook, connect OneDrive, connect whatever else, and then it will kick in and start downloading. But OneDrive has a second layer where it says, oh, you can not sync some of these files. So if I create these directories or files on my desktop, it will not necessarily automatically sync to my laptop and vice versa. So I have to tell it, ah, pull these files down. I want you definitely to pull these down and keep them local, keep a local copy. That's an optional setting and I had that on my laptop. So I was running into a bunch of these. I had to first enable OneDrive to work on the metered connection with my hotspot, then I had to pull these down. It worked, but it was a bit of a hassle. So that was fine. Um, the other issue I ran into, which was interesting, was I had some files on my desktop and my LAN and my NAS that were accessible on my desktop, but I couldn't get them to my laptop when I was on a hotspot. My laptop couldn't connect to my LAN because I was using the hotspot for Wi-Fi. My desktop couldn't send sync up to OneDrive because it was wired only and I don't have Wi-Fi uh, wi on my current desktop. So my new desktop, I do have Wi-Fi, so I need to just confirm if I'm tethered uh, to my cell phone for hotspot, can I still be wired to my LAN and share files between those two? If so, that'll solve my problem. I've just never done that before, so I just need to test that. So if I am using my phone as a hotspot, 
do I still have full connectivity to my LAN, just making the file sharing seamless and I can still RDP into my VMs or my Docker server, whatever the case is. So that was interesting. Okay, so that's been my adventures with audio gear and internet outages. So let's talk about some Business Central stuff. You're like, finally, Steve, come on, get to the point. Um, so on the Business Central side, last week, week and a half ago, I learned about something called NCE. This is an abbreviation for the Microsoft New Commerce Experience, apparently. And this, I, I had read about, uh, I had read an article about this, but I didn't know it was called NCE or New Commerce Experience. And I had no idea that it applied to Dynamics offerings. I had read about it as an increase in prices for Microsoft Office subscriptions, like consumer subscriptions, and that Office was no longer being offered on a month-to-month -month basis. It was going to be an annual subscription. If you wanted to continue month-to-month, -month, it would be a 20% price hike. And I thought, oh, for whatever reason, I thought consumer offer, Microsoft Office, whatever. That's, I believe, what the article was talking about. I, I don't recall any mention of something called NCE, New Commerce Experience, and I don't recall any mention of CSP offerings. Well, I have been informed that this is applying to Business Central and all Dynamics 365 products apparently sold through a CSP. So any CSP license apparently. Now there are all sorts of details to this, but if you are selling or or paying for Business Central SaaS licenses through a CSP, it is subject and will be transitioned to the NCE program. What does that mean? By default, most customers will migrate to the 12 month subscription, the annual subscription for your Business Central SaaS licenses in order to maintain your current prices. If you stay on the one month, month to month subscription, it will have a 20% price increase, which is not trivial. Um, now, I, I think the default assumption is that most customers will wanna switch to the 12 month subscription to maintain their current pricing. But if you do that, you're locked in. You cannot cancel that one, one year that 12 month subscription once you purchase it. Whereas month to month, you can do adds and removes, uh, upgrade or downgrade um, on, let's see, upgrades are permitted midterm for some products, downgrades are not permitted on any license. So I guess you can't downgrade mid month, but you can let that month to month expire, I guess. So anyway, there are all sorts of weird caveats for these this NCE program. Like if you have five licenses with this partner and you want to switch partners, those five licenses, those annual subscription licenses cannot be switched to another partner. They have to run out their term and expire, but you can buy new licenses through a different partner, all this weird stuff. So I, I'm not getting to get into licensing, but if you haven't heard this, you need to look into the NCE licensing program for uh, CSP licenses, I guess. And I'm told this applies to all Business Central CSP licenses. So I've spoken to a lot of people who have not heard of this. So my myself being one of them, I had no idea. I've never read any of this online, on Twitter, Yammer, newsletters, emails, whatever, till someone happened to tell me about it. So with that, Another interesting item. Um, this was a forum post that caught my eye. This is on the um, Microsoft Community Dynamics Forum or Dynamics Community Forum. And this is a question about API, a Business Central Web API queries with OData date filters using URL encoding. And the background is that uh, this person is using BizTalk 
to call Business Central Web APIs. And apparently by default, BizTalk is encoding the URL before submitting it to the uh, Business Central Web API endpoint. And so he offers some examples. So the top one is a filter unencoded with document date greater than document date less than, and that works fine in Postman. But he is seeing that when it starts to get encoded by BizTalk, it is not working. It, he's saying it returns no results. So it's like, huh, I never thought of that. I've tested in Postman and I never really paid attention to what got encoded and what didn't. So I started research and rather th before I jumped right into testing, I went to the OData v4 specifications because that filter at the end of the URL for Business Central Web APIs, that filter format and syntax is part of the OData v4 specification. So I looked this up and I found this section. This is the 4.01 specification, part two URL conventions, section 2.2 URL syntax. And they mention this, they don't do, they don't offer a whole lot, but they mention, um, they show a couple valid OData URLs and they talk about um, URL uh, encoding or what they call percent encoding representation. And they say percent encoded representation is treated identical to the plain literal representation. What in the world does that even mean? And they offer these very, very basic examples, which uses a different format than what Business Central uses. So here you see a URL with a people endpoint, and then they have parentheses, like people parentheses O'Neill. And on, oh, in Business Central, we would have dollar sign filter equals, you know, last name um, EQ O'Neill, something to that effect. But in this example, there are parentheses instead of filter equals. So they do people parentheses O'Neill, they do people parentheses and then O'Neill with a URL encoding or percent encoded. So they have the percent 27 for um, the apostrophes. And then they show you can even encode the parentheses, which was surprising to me. Now, I think I tested this on Business Central and that did not work for me, but, or at least the equal sign encoding did not work for me. So you, you may need to do some trial and error here, but, but basically you gotta be careful with this URL encoding. Um, and they showed what happens if uh, you just have a, um, a slash, it looks like, smartphone slash tablet. And so then they show some invalid OData URLs where it's mixing apostrophes plus encoding. So it's like if you're going to encode the, the string literal you're going to search for, you have to encode the whole thing. You can't keep the apostrophes on the outside of your string literal and then encode the apostrophes inside. You, you have to like escape everything, it seems. And so not a great example, but it kind of tells you it's possible. So I did some tests in Postman, and this is what I responded to in the forum. And I said, I, I tested with items. That's what I had handy. Items, question mark, dollar sign, filter, equal sign, and then number, space, EQ, space, and then my string literal to search for an item number. And then I said, well, what if I URL encode this? And my URL encoding did everything. So after the dollar sign filter, even the equal sign was replaced. That did not work in my test. So I said, okay, what if I add the equal sign back, but everything after the equal sign gets URL encoded? That did work. It's like, okay, well, it seems to work. URL encoding in concept with Business Central Web APIs. So then I tried to replicate the date range scenario that the um, original poster was testing with. And I did invoice date greater than equal to and invoice date less than equal to, and that worked. So I kept my parentheses, but everything within my parentheses for my filters, including the spaces and the and uh, keyword, that all got escaped in URL encoded and it, it worked fine. 
So it's like, hmm, it looks in concept like it should work for what he's trying to do. The only thing I saw at, odd was in his examples, he, and it might have just been how he posted it and, and he, he mistyped something in his post. He did ampersand dollar sign filter. And I've made this mistake before. You notice he has ampersand dollar sign filter. And what you need, if you look at my examples, is you need question mark dollar sign filter. So you have your URL web um, URL to your uh, web API endpoint, such as my case, purchase invoices. Then you do a question mark. Then you do your dollar sign filter. And I, I spent hours wondering why my uh, queries didn't work. And it was because of that. So I see he's made the same mistake I have, apparently. That's my guess. Ampersand dollar sign filter. Now, maybe he had something beforehand. And this is appropriate to have the ampersand. But I just wanted to check. Did he really mean question mark? Anyway, so something to consider. I, I hadn't thought about URL encoding of your uh, web API call because you know uh, Postman kind of handles it. Most code applications or tools are going to do what they do, but it's something to watch out for. So I'll be on the lookout for that if I use a tool, do some testing, and I'll see how that goes. But anyway, take a deep breath. So be on the lookout for that NCE Business Central licensing. And if you work with Business Central Web APIs, check out those URLs and your encoding. And so try and have a good weekend in these um, rather crazy times. And um, yeah, go try and um, fry some audio gear, have some redundant um, internet capabilities and uh, play with Business Central. Enjoy.